Welcome back everyone to part five of this extended look at the story of Genghis Khan. Uh, if you have not seen the first four episodes of this series, there's a link in the description to episode one of my reaction, as well as the link to episode five, the original content, if you want to check that out without my commentary. Big thank you to all of our patrons who make so much of what I do on this channel possible. If you're interested and you want to learn more about signing up to be a supporter of this channel through Patreon, there are a number of perks that you get. There's a link down in the description that will take you to Patreon. Uh, we are going to be doing another um, private live stream sometime later this week. I will post that on Patreon uh, and for members here on YouTube when I know exactly when that'll be. Let's dive into part five. Here, after defeating his greatest rival, Temujin Khan summoned the greatest and most important Kurultai in Mongolian history. After many days of ceremony and ritual, and many nights of celebration, Temujin is elected Khan of all Mongols. Again, so fascinating that everything he does, he includes people in it to make it feel like it's a corporate decision. It's not just him dictating to everyone how it's going to be. Now, it may be in practice that that's what's happening. I mean, there's really no other alternative that's going to come out of this. It's not like they were going to pick somebody else. So while it's a foregone conclusion, it gives them the feeling of having the power and of having made it happen. And I want to go back to something that happened yesterday that a number of you pointed out that many of you might not have seen the comment. Uh, when uh, his uh, final victory happens and uh, his one-time brother but now rival uh, is brought to him by members of his own uh, group, uh, Genghis Khan apparently had those people executed for betraying their own man, who he then executed anyway. But uh, it was that kind of like, um, uh, you know, he's my enemy, but you still didn't have a right to do it. There's a story in the Bible that's similar to that, where um, King David has been harassed and chased and hunted for years by King Saul because David has been anointed to be the next king of Israel. And Saul sees David as a threat, so he tries to kill him. But when Saul goes into battle with the Philistines, uh, and he's severely wounded, and he, he doesn't want to die at the hands of the Philistines, he has a guy with him finish him off so he won't go into the hands of the Philistines. That guy then goes to David and reports what he had done, and David has the guy executed because he said, you had no right to touch the Lord's anointed, even though the guy that he killed had been trying to kill David. You know, he there was still a sense of honor and a sense of the right thing to do. So interesting. And chooses a new title for himself, Genghis Khan. At the age of 45, Genghis Khan controlled a vast territory and over one million souls. His domain stretched from the Gobi Desert in the south to the Arctic Tundra in the north. So remember, we're talking about a time in history when there are about 400 million people estimated, we have no way of knowing for sure, on the entire planet. So 1 million is way more compared to today uh, than it was back then. When did the math real quick? It's, it'd be the equivalent today of about 20 million people in terms of the percentage of the population. So a significant chunk of people, but not huge. From the Manchurian forests in the east to the Altai Mountains to the west, he named his new people the Great Mongol Nation. He abolished inherited aristocratic titles, criminalized the abduction or enslavement of any Mongol, forbade the selling and kidnapping of women, declared all children born of Mongol parents to be legitimate. And so, so fascinating how much of uh, the stuff that he's doing now we can trace back to his childhood. He's passing laws to basically have an impact on people that would be born into similar situations as him to prevent them from going through what he went through. And made livestock theft punishable by death. Hmm. He ordered the adoption of a writing system, conducted a census, and instituted diplomatic immunity and freedom of religion, exempting all religious leaders and their property from taxation and public huh. service. Eventually, he extended this tax exemption to anybody who provided essential public services, including undertakers, doctors, lawyers, teachers, and scholars. With the nomadic tribes united and Genghis Khan established as their leader, his next step wasn't clear. 
He had spent so many years locked in conflict with Jamaka and Onkan that now his enormous tribe lacked a mission. So he turned his gaze beyond the steppe and engaged in a series of raids against the Tangut Empire. In they, sometimes people say that uh, when you come to power um, through conquest, through defeating others, then you basically can never stop doing that because at some point someone will see you as the target. So you kind of almost always have to be on the offensive. And we see this happen with other people. Napoleon was that way. It's so easy to look back at Napoleon and say, why didn't you just stop when you got to whatever point? The Germans in the 1930s, the same way. Why didn't they just say, okay, this is enough? It just seems like it's part of their DNA that they have to keep going with it. And that's what Genghis Khan's gonna do. In what is now Western China, Unlike the nomadic steppe tribes, the Tangut had walled cities, moats, and fortresses. Mm. Their armies were nearly twice the size of Genghis Khan's. In these campaigns, he had to adopt new methods of warfare to adapt to these conditions. He quickly learned classic siege techniques such as cutting off his enemy's food supply, but soon began experimenting with new tactics. On one raid, he attempted to divert a nearby river to flood the city. Despite scant experience in engineering, the Mongols did succeed in diverting the river, but they wiped out their own camp instead Oops. of the Tangut. They survived their mistake, though, and went on to conquer the city. And with every siege, the Mongols would learn, and eventually become experts at devastating enemy cities. The more you do something, the better you get at it, right? I mean, the first few times, it's a little messy, it's a little difficult, it doesn't quite go the way you'd like, but by the time you do something over and over and over again, you start to get good at it. And all the while, what I love about this story is that he's not just conquering, but keeping things the status quo. He's always looking at ways to better things. Napoleon did this too. Napoleon instituted all kinds of reforms that were honestly very good things. We can't always see, you know, it's so funny to, to see these, con these great conquerors who who commit these what we would call atrocities by you know slaughtering so many people and conquering them and taking their land but at the same time also instituting things that make life better for the people they've conquered it's it's very interesting until this point not many people outside of mongolia had taken much notice of the upstart barbarian chief or his newly proclaimed nation this was about to change in 1210, when Genghis Khan was 48, the Jurchid nation sent a delegation from their capital city of Zhengdu, where modern-day Beijing now lies. Ong Khan had previously sworn allegiance to them, so now they came to demand the submission of Genghis Khan. Upon hearing this order, Genghis Khan turned in the direction of their nation to the south, spat on the ground, unleashed a line of insults, and then mounted his horse and rode north, leaving the stunned envoy choking in his dust. The Mongol army advanced to the south, sending squads of soldiers ahead to scout for decent pasture, seek out water sources, and report on weather conditions. Their previous raids in the Tangut Empire turned out to be a perfect practice for their campaign against their Jurchid neighbors. Desert crossings and siege warfare were now solved problems. And the Mongols had another surprising advantage, their diet. Traditional armies traveled in long columns with massive supply trains. The Mongols, in contrast, spread out over a vast area to provide sufficient pasture for their animals. This is again something that Napoleon did. By breaking his army into corps and having them spread out to where they're, they're apart, but they're close enough together that they can rapidly come back together. It allows them to move quicker. It allows them to rely on fewer supplies. And in this case, the amount of grazing land that is needed for all these horses. Uh, so like I said, nothing new under the sun. Stuff that Napoleon's going to be doing hundreds of years later is being done here just with a primarily mounted army. And each warrior hunted for himself or carried his own individual supplies. Though dispersed, the Mongols' strict decimal organization system was diligently enforced, such that each unit, with its own doctors and commanders, always knew where to report and how to find what they needed. And because most of the Mongol army was illiterate, and communication across such a large area was critical, the officers came up with a novel solution. 
orders were composed in rhyme to ensure that messages were easily memorized and repeated huh. to each new person exactly as they were originally spoken. Command and control has always uh, been a make or break thing for armies. Uh, a lot of times the best fighting, the best equipped, uh, the larger force does not win because they're outsmarted by better command and control. Uh, and so anything you can do to simplify, to make yourself more efficient, to um, allow for better command and control is going to go a long way. The Mongols also launched propaganda campaigns to break the spirit of the Jurchid people, claiming that the Mongols were coming as a liberating force to free them from the oppressive royal family. More than a few Jurchid defected to join him. In the end, they found victory by transforming the Jurchid's greatest asset, their large population, into a weakness. They terrorized the countryside and conscripted local peasants, clearing out all the surrounding villages before turning their sights to the larger cities, using peasants as human shields. Rounding up an enemy's herds and stampeding them toward their owner's battle lines was a traditional step tactic, but the Mongols modified this old classic by using enemy peasants instead, attacking and burning undefended villages and sending terrified peasants fleeing in all directions. So let's be honest here. We've been spending a lot of the last four plus episodes now singing the praises of Temujin, of Genghis Khan. But let's not, let's not dance around the fact. I mean, they're using civilians as human shields. They're making their conquest possible by causing the death of a lot of non-combatants. So um, while he's doing some good things... Uh, this is still conquest. This is still war. It's ugly. It's brutal. It's not honorable at times, but you do what you have to do to win. At least that's the way he's looking at this. Clogging highways and making it difficult for the Jurchid supply caravans to move. Over the course of the campaign, more than one million refugees fled the countryside and poured into the cities, causing chaos and food shortages. The Jurchid military ended up executing tens of thousands of their own people just to maintain enough food stores to mm. feed their armies. During this campaign, Genghis Khan discovered that Chinese engineers had developed powerful machines to batter city walls from afar. To adapt these massive war machines to fit his mobile army, he began hosting a corps of engineers on every campaign, who would camp in the forests close to target cities and cut down enough wood to build siege engines on the spot. In wow. 1214, despite some difficulties... Wait, so I need to know what kind of, what specific, like, we, were these trebuchets? I need to look this up and learn a little more. So it seems from everything I'm reading, they did have a form of trebuchet. Uh, they also had catapults. They also uh, had learned from the Chinese gunpowder bombs. So they were using early gunpowder and explosives. Uh, fascinating stuff, man. I mean, this is not the kind of thing you think about when thinking about 13th century warfare with the Mongols, but apparently they did, in fact, have some of that. Adapting to the hot, damp climate, Genghis Khan finally besieged the capital city of Chengdu. The Jurchid had endured so much strife by then that they quickly agreed to a settlement, rather than face a prolonged siege. In return for Mongol withdrawal, the Jurchid leader, known as the Golden Khan, swore allegiance to Genghis Khan and offered massive amounts of silk, silver, gold, horses, and people. As soon as the Mongols left, however, the Golden Khan and his entire royal court fled, hoping to get far enough away to escape the reach of the Mongol army. Genghis Khan saw this as a breach of their agreement and returned to sack the capital. This time, Genghis Khan offered no opportunity to negotiate. They looted the city according to the new Mongol law. They took absolutely everything, inventoried it, and distributed it amongst the army. As a final punishment, as the Mongol warriors retreated to their homeland, they churned up the earth behind them and trampled it with their horses. Genghis Khan wanted to ensure that the peasants never returned to their fields. Mm. Besides, this way he could convert the land to open pasture, both to feed his newly captured livestock and to allow easier access in future campaigns in the region. But in the years that Genghis Khan had been raiding abroad, trouble had begun to brew at home. Some of his most steadfast followers, the Muslim Uyghurs of the desert oases, supported him so strongly that other Uyghurs living- Aren't these the same people? that there are issues with today in China. 
Somebody help me out on that. Is that? I mean, I think that's the same group of people. And I'll admit, I don't know nearly enough about that political situation, but I know there's some kind of persecution going on with that group of Muslims in uh, modern day China. I think that's who they are. Moving further to the west in modern day Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, wished to overthrow their Buddhist rulers and join Genghis Khan as well. Some sent envoys to Mongol lands seeking an alliance, but others were under the control of Kuchlug, the son of the Naiman Khan who had harbored Jamaka. In his new position of power, Kuchlug began to persecute his Muslim subjects, forbidding the call to prayer, public worship, or Muslim religious study. Without a ruler to protect them, the Muslim Uyghurs turned to Genghis Khan to overthrow their oppressor. Although the Mongol army was thousands of miles away, Genghis Khan sent 20,000 soldiers wow. under the command of one of his generals to defend the Muslims. And because they were engaging in this campaign at the request of their allies, this time they did not raid or loot the capital city, but instead simply defeated the army, beheaded Kuchlug, and returned home, leaving behind a herald to proclaim the restoration of religious freedom in the land. Hmm. Most importantly to Genghis Khan, this victory ensured complete control over the Silk Road between oh. the Chinese and the Muslims. Although he didn't control the Sung Dynasty, where silk was produced, or the primary purchasing areas in the Middle East, he rerouted the twisting channels of the Silk Road into one large stream over the course of his campaign. You don't have to control the source of the supply or the end place where it gets sold if you control everything in between. You can make money because these people over here can't sell their stuff to those people over there if they can't get their product there. So, hey, that works. And directed it through the Mongol steppes. So much silk passed through his land that the Mongols even started using it as a packing material. Suddenly, life on the steppe looked very different than it had before. Rawhide ropes were exchanged for silk cords. Fur and leather clothes were replaced with robes embroidered in silver and gold. Yurts were decorated with silk rugs, pillows, and blankets. Perfume, makeup, jewelry, board games, paper fans, incense, honey, wine, and tea became commonplace. Skilled artisans, scholars, and entertainers from across Genghis Khan's empire contributed their art, science, mm. and culture to Mongol society. Man, this is... Uh, I love this stuff. This is not, you know... Most of us who don't really study this time period... I think the extent of our knowledge is Genghis Khan had a horde of horsemen who just ran roughshod through Asia and conquered all these people and piled their decapitated heads and big giant piles. And, um, you know, that's about the extent of it. You don't think about religious tolerance and uh, new model armies and culture and all of these sorts of things. This is really fascinating stuff. The Muslims in the region, from the mountains of modern Afghanistan to the Black Sea, produced steel, the finest of all metals, as well as cotton and glass. Genghis Khan wanted these novel luxuries also. He sent ambassadors to the Sultan with gifts, approaching not as a conqueror, but as an ally, seeking an equal trade agreement. With great suspicion, the Sultan accepted. Genghis Khan sent hundreds of merchants from his newly acquired territories in caravans laden with goods to trade. As soon as the caravan entered their territory, however, a local official seized the goods and killed the merchants, completely unaware of the incredible mistake he had just made. You done messed up, A.A. Ron. Oh my gosh. I mean, think about how sometimes some minor, no-name dude who's just takes matters into his own hands can change history for his people. Man, what was this guy thinking? I know he wasn't. He wasn't thinking this was a big deal or he wouldn't have done it. When Genghis Khan heard of this, he sent envoys to the Sultan asking him to punish the man responsible for the attack. Instead, the Sultan doubled down and killed some of the Mongol envoys, maiming the others and sending them back to the Khan. Genghis Khan was furious. So enraged was he by this insult that he withdrew once again to his sacred mountaintop to pray and decide on a course of action. After three days of contemplation, he descended with his intentions set. The Mongols were going to war. Oh, man. Oh, this is, oh, this is such a great story. I, am in, I have been enjoying this so much. I hope you guys have been too. 
I've learned a lot. This is why it's so good sometimes. It's so easy to get in our comfort zone historically. You know, I just, I could spend all my time reading about World War One and the Civil War and, um, you know, British medieval history. I, n I would miss out on stories like this that aren't necessarily in my wheelhouse historically. But man, this is great stuff, and uh, I've really enjoyed it. I hope you guys have too. Uh, please hit that like button if you have. Check out Patreon. Consider being a part of that. I'm about to add some new uh, merch as perks, and I'm always open to suggestions for ideas for perks that we can offer to our members and our patrons. So let me know. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.